Thank you all for coming, um, and thank you to Global Sign for organising this. So I don't know, I don't know how many of you know the relationship between YSAN and Global Sign, but I'll do a brief explanation. YSAN Alliance, um, we've been going for a while. We have a uh, field area network profile, which is uh, I'll come to later. As part of that, because we're using uh, certificate-based authentication, a number of our member companies already have their own CAs, but part of YSUN's role in all of this is to try and commoditize the communications to create an ecosystem, and therefore we were looking for a CA vendor that could serve the smaller companies in our group, so people that are just creating IoT solutions, uh, the companies that are doing modules that um, that we could then provide some sort of scalability to them. So we we worked with we actually did an RFP. Global Sign came out with some really um, attractive and forward looking propositions. And I think and I I don't want to steal uh, Lance and Thunder. I haven't seen his presentation, but one of the things that's really important for this industry. I think is that we're not just talking about small scale, a few hundred thousand uh, certificates, we're talking about huge numbers here for IoT. And that is really important for us to ensure they're cost effective and that you have a very large scale life cycle. So that's why we ended up uh, working with Global Sign. So, what is Lifetime? We are, and apologies if you've seen this presentation before, there are some new slides at the end that um, would keep you captivated. Um, we're about open standards based, interoperable communications for large scale outdoor IoT. Um, this initially started with uh, smart utility networks. Um, going way, way back, uh, I guess, to around 2007, 2008, um, Florida Power and Light, Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, started doing AMI deployments using Silver Spring Networks. So at that time we're a smallish startup in the Bay Area. Um, there was, people didn't know how long they were going to be around, um, so there was a requirement to prevent vendor lock-in. I ended up working for PG&E and chairing 802.15.4G to start the standardization process. So YSUN was established in 2012 when 154G was completed. Uh, we are a not for profit organization incorporated in Delaware, but we have regional offices. Um, fairly small, but we have local representation. So we have a presence in uh, Europe, which is where I'm based, uh, India, where we have a representative, Japan, North America, and Singapore. So, Another thing that you possibly noticed on that last slide of Global Sign was their global presence. They actually align very well with our, our offices as well, which is useful. Um, we started with eight promoter member companies, eight founders in 2012. We now have over 170 member companies. So the organization is growing rapidly. Um, and that's a range of people that you would need, companies you would need to deliver the ecosystem. So we specify uh, communications profiles based on the radio standard 802.15.4G and then other applicable standards either from IEEE or from ITF, TIA, um, and even some X and stuff. And we're about defining testing and certification program. So the problem with standards is there are usually so many options in some of them by the method by which standards are derived that it makes it very difficult to achieve interoperability. What Bison has done is actually distill this collection of standards. There's a, an eye chart later that shows you what standards we've taken. And then we specify which are the mandatory parts of this. So you can create one part from physical layer to the top of the transport layer that everybody must implement and that provides that basis for interoperability. Um, the IEEE and uh, or IEEE 802 and uh, IETF don't specify testing programs; they just specify the standards. 
So you need another organization to develop the testing and certification program, that's what we do. And then YSUN is a forum for member companies to collaborate and also promote themselves and their products. So we're basically about enabling multi-vendor interoperability for complex ecosystems. And that first saw light in things like, um, oh, sorry, let, let me just talk about this. So YSUN sees itself <laughs> in a similar way to Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi took a standard which was 802.11 and created a brand that basically guarantees interoperability. People just use Wi-Fi, they expect it to work, they don't expect to have to read all the small print to know that this new router they buy it bought is going to work with their laptop and stuff. And this industry is slightly different, so we may, maybe we'll never get to that true seamless interoperability, but we can certainly go a long way to getting close to it. And we're all about communication. One of the great successes of Wi-Fi lives is they don't try and spread themselves too thin and, and cover too many different aspects of uh, the ecosystem. It's all about comms. Why so? It's just about the communications. So this repeats some of what I've already said. We've got two primary activities really, but one in field area networks, the other in home energy management systems that uh, basically came out of our Japanese market and our Japanese members. So what we don't do, we're not a standard setting organization or an SDO. We are what SGIP1 called an ITCA, so an interoperability testing and certification authority. Um, when we are creating a comms profile that we then create a testing program from, we discover maybe anomalies in the standards, gaps in the standards. We will do work within YSUN and then take it back to the relevant standards organisation to do the work. So, and an example of this is key management over uh, 802154. Um, and there's a slide later that I'll talk about that. And we don't specify application layers, so you can run a, a range of different app layers over a Bison network. <coughs> Our primary target is uh, specified here, really utility industry, which is our background. Um, you know, people think of IoT as being a new, a new idea, but the utilities have been doing this for a decade. Um, Maybe, in fact, the SCADA system is even longer. So I, IoT is not new at all. It's um, the util and look, utilities were our background, particularly with AMI. Um, but we're seeing much, a lot of interest now in smart cities, um, particularly in things like street lighting canopies that provide ingress points for a whole range of IoT sensors. So therefore, the whole scale of uh, large-scale outdoor IoT is growing dramatically. As I mentioned before, we have a profile that supports home automation um, and we're finding interest in things like uh, other end-to-end, -end, like structural health, agriculture. There is actually a um, project in Okinawa uh, where they're using YSUN technology to do the um, environmental control for greenhouses, uh, for growing mangoes, etc. Apparently there is a seaweed farm off the coast of Okinawa that is using YSUN technology as a way of uh, basically collecting data. So, a whole load of different ranges. Uh, and then things like monitoring and asset management as well. So we have a group of promoter members. Um, as you'll see, some of the big, big names in the utility industry up until Last week, Silver Spring Networks were on here, but due to our bylaws, they've gone. They've now been assimilated into Itron, so we're all interested to see how that pans out. Uh, and so I say that somewhat flippantly, but the way, the way we're incorporated, the way we're structured, means that it's not possible for one large organization to basically buy a block vote on the board of directors, which is really important. We're not for profit collaborative uh, organisation who's supporting the interests of all our members and their customers. We've got uh, a large number of uh, contributor members, 
um, which includes quite a few utility companies in. So we're, we we like to encourage utilities to actually contribute to requirements and the testing and certification requirements. And if your name's off on this list, I apologise. We try and keep it up to date, but it grows very quickly. And if it's not on this list because you're not a member, well, I have you join. Um, our testing is all done by independent third-party test labs. Because RF is involved, we expect a certain level of competence, so we're asked we ask for test labs to be 17025. Uh, that's most of these people here have been doing RF testing either with Wi Fi or Zigbee or Bluetooth, so they understand how to test. Um, and then we ensure that we always have two left test labs competing in any geographical region, at least two labs, which gives our, uh, our vendors choice. So we develop profiles, and I'll skip over this one, but very quickly, um, basically, physical layer radio, uh, 15.4, base 15.4G was the first sub gigahertz, then U and B added uh, uh, frequency bands for India, um, European bands, and some of Southeast Asia, so uh, places like Thailand have opened up spectrum recently. So the idea is that we, come up with a consistent RF um, modulation, uh, channel planning. Unfortunately, the ISM band, so the open bands in, uh, there's no one global band in the, the low range as there is with 2.4 gig, which is used for Wi-Fi. But I think we, we're able to establish commonality in the 900 meg and a certain commonality in 800. 800 meg. And we also do a fair amount of lobbying to try and get some harmonization across spectrum. Europe has been quite difficult at the moment, but there are members working there to try and get Europe to actually come into the 21st century. Um, and, and not give it all to the telcos and not give it all, <coughs> all to the railway companies, which is what they're trying to do. Anyway, that's another story. Meet me in the bar for if you want more on that one. Um, so we have two specific working groups for the utilities. One is the field area network, um, and that's co-chaired by Cisco and it was Cisco and Silver Spring, it's now Cisco and Nitron. Uh, we've got a feature complete specification that we've been complete for quite a long time, but uh, we've been working through interop events. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but it supports uh, uh, wireless mesh, um, so it's a mesh architecture with multi-hop, with self-forming, self-healing. There's frequency hopping, frequency hopping methodology is very interesting as well. Um, supports AES and uh, 802.1x authentication, which I guess I'll also we'll talk a bit more. Um, as I said previously, we don't hold the intellectual property for the standard within YSUM, we deploy this back into an open standards organization. Um, we put every, all the work we do, we work closely with DIA, um, who have delivered this as an ANSI specification, which is 4957. There's current revision going on, but that's where we're putting this. So you can buy the YSUM spec as an ANSI spec. Then we have the home area networking group. And this, this came out of basically around the time uh, 154G was completed and the time YSUM was formed was also the time that Japan was, was going from a position of great energy surplus to an energy deficit. And a, a, so this was shortly after Fukushima. So we were going to a position where they really needed to bring in some energy management. Um, so. There was a, there's a whole history of this, but why, why some was selected first by TEPCO to provide the wireless communication between smart meter and home energy management system. And then it was, it was recognized that people wanted to take their home energy, ma their home energy management controller systems. You know, they might move from Tokyo to Osaka and that meant going across to a different utility. So the whole of the Japanese utility industry is now adopted by some of this. Uh, you would have seen that LG did a press release about six months ago saying they put out 
fair 10 million meter, including the technology. Um, I think we're expecting about 65 million meters by 2020 across the whole of Japan. Um, so, the White Sun Plan use cases. Uh, traditional uh, utility use cases such as AMI, um, distribution automation, finding more interesting things like EV charging. Distributed generation is really interesting as well. So wireless mesh is great for providing uh, the edge computing or distributed uh, control that you need for a DER uh, type solution. But if you go to our website, we had a presentation at our last member meeting from Hawaii Electric Company who are committed to delivering 100% renewable by 2038, I think it is. And they see Wysun as being a key part of uh, delivering that on that requirement. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we're also seeing things like uh, outdoor street lighting, where a canopy is very useful. Uh, and then with things like integration of traffic management and parking. And for smart cities, there's a really good business case for deploying LED street light replacements. And while you're doing that, deploying uh, wireless connectivity, why some provides a very good method for doing that. And then, so uh, cities like Copenhagen justified the rollout purely on the street lighting. And now they're starting to integrate other sensors. So things like um, uh, traffic sensor, even bicycle management. So Copenhagen has something, I think it's about 2 million cyclists. Uh, so, and they take priority. If anybody's been to Europe, you don't run over a cyclist in Europe. That's so anyway, traffic flow, so doing sensing, another example of really important edge computing, knowing, knowing how many uh, vehicles are passing any junction, be they cyclists, pedestrians, or cars. And then you can integrate that with street, uh, parking as well. So we have a mesh network. It's not mesh all the way to the back office. You need some sort of border router, um, and this could connect by cellular. WiMAX, um, a number of utilities are deploying WiMAX or fiber Ethernet. So as you can see, you're looking, we're looking at going from across boundaries. Uh, there are some technologies where you produce a gateway. A gateway gives you uh, a security vulnerability. Being able to route here is great. And there's a picture later that just gives an overview. So there's a whole list of the, the attributes for field area networks. But number one for us is uh, certificate-based authentication. So high security, we're looking at critical infrastructure networks for utilities and the cities as well. So you know, sometimes within smart city environments, people don't necessarily value how important their network is and the disaster that can occur to a city if you screw the bit of traffic management system, for example, or the public safety aspects of it. So, you know, for us, security is really key. And as you mentioned earlier, it goes to the heart of the design of uh, what you're doing. Um, and again, longevity, and I've been talking with people on the booth, so what we have now is why some fans are though. I'm talking a bit more about what we, where we go next. But the great thing about putting everything based on open standards is that the standards organisations offer a migration path. And Pigeon Wi-Fi is an example again. You know, nobody even thinks about the fact that you've got 11AB and 11G and 802.11N, and they just all work together. Now it's never going to be that easy with what we're doing, but we are very sensitive to the, to the fact that when you deploy a network, you don't want to strand assets. That network's going to last for 20 years, even though you may want to incorporate new technology. A whole load of other things here. Bottom one, multi-vendor interoperability. That's absolutely key. It's really important you can buy solutions for multiple vendors. And that becomes even more important when you want to look at integrating specialist type devices onto your network. So the guys that know 
how to do bulk bar optimization don't need one to be security experts and they don't want to necessarily be comms experts. They want to be able to take the comms module and put it into a solution and they've got this great little piece of application, uh, so a combination of sensor and application that just sits on that. In the same way that they can run it over Wi-Fi on their PC or their Raspberry Pi. So a little bit about um, how am I doing for time? Okay. Okay. So a little bit about mesh architectures. So I'm an engineer, and Wi-Fi has been going for quite a long time. We recently uh, had a, a, a Marina Donovan as a, has been appointed as our marketing chair. She describes why some as one of the best tech secrets uh, in the IoT space, basically because I don't talk enough about it, believe it or not. Um, but anyway, recent research by Navigant showed that um, in the US, uh, nearly 77% of AMI deployments are using wireless mesh. And these wireless mesh are actually why some compatible nodes. So they're not necessarily certified, but they're coming from vendors that are members of y uh, are members of Wisum. They're using the same radios, the same technology, and with a firmware upgrade, could be a Wisum compliant solution. Now that so that's accounts for about 61 million endpoints in the U.S. and 88 million endpoints uh, worldwide. So we have proven technology here. What Wisum has been about is trying to basically harmonize this into a multi-vendor interoperable uh, solution. You'll notice that um, Europe and China have got a large number of PLC uh, nodes out there. I'm going to talk a little bit about the integration of PLC and uh, wireless later as well. So here's our protocol stack. I don't intend to go into the whole detail of this, but every one of these boxes has an open standard associated with it that you can just get hold of. Unfortunately, if you try and implement the whole thing, you won't end up with interoperability and you'll probably need a fairly large amount of flash to put the code into. So Wise Others created interoperable profiles um, based on each of these standards. One slide on security architecture. I don't want to talk too much about this, but I think it just reflects the um, initial comments that the security architecture for IoT that you see here resembles very well what you might have in, a, in an IT environment. So you may or may not want to use the same radio server for your OT network, but you can still use the same technology so you can still use all the same tools to manage it. Um, so this is the way we deploy. I'm sure you'll hear more about this later, and if you don't, then you can talk to us about what we're doing here. We have a couple of videos that you show. Oh, a video and um, a white paper. Uh, so if you go to these links, and this will be on our website later, um, if you go to these links, you can have a look at the benefits of Mesh. And then we did a, uh, uh, a white paper on comparing IoT technologies. So that's a comparison of Wisan, LoRa, and MDIoT. So it goes into a little bit of depth, maybe not as much technical depth as people might want. But networking technology is very much forces for courses. So it's really important that people pick the right technology for what they want to do. Let me talk about certification. So those of you that have been following Wisum realize that it's been a little while to get here, um, but it's not easy to do. Uh, we're testing mesh networks from multiple vendors and we want to do it properly. So the way we do this, we have a test bed controller, which is a script-driven engine, which automates the device certification. We have a test bed that in incorporates 14 what we call test bed units, other organizations put them, may, may call them golden units, um, but there's no such thing as really as a golden unit. So we have what are reference devices from uh, at least three different vendors. And then we're using uh, Wireshark protocol decoder 
uh, which has had extensions for some of the information elements we use. And that's integrated into the test bed controller and it's integrated into the test bed. We also have one of the requirements of the test bed units is that they provide a Wireshark um, formatted uh, output through an API of the data they collect. So you can, I don't know how many people are interested or know about the way you test this sort of stuff, but what it means is that you can look at all the stuff that's going over air and you can look at the interpretation of the stuff from the units and then you can also make the decoding and verification of those frames. So that's what it looks like. We have the control computer and then there'll be some sort of hardware interface to the test bed units. Um, and then this is the RF design. So we have a number of devices that constitute the test bed. And out here, we have the different um, uh, actor roles of what the device under test is having to do. So the device under test is testing as is a black box. We don't need to intrude into what's going on in there. So you can actually do a, a full product testing on that. It doesn't need any special interface. And the, you're, you're basically just looking at the, the conversation. Anyway, I can talk for hours on this. I'm not going to. Uh, our planned certification testing events, we currently had about 15 interop events for the field area network. So vendors get together, they test their implementation, <coughs> they verify the test specification, they verify the profile spec. When we discover anomalies, we update it and we have a, uh, we're using an agile method for doing this within the working group for doing updates. When we discover an anomaly with a open standard, then we feed it back into the standards organization. So we are now having test bed events where we're actually building, dynamically building the test bed environment, and the fifth one is going to be held next week at uh, Cisco and San Jose. Uh, global side has been selected as the certificate authority provider. What we've done so far is uh, basically we have a test certificate generator that was written by one of our member companies to just do the initial testing. So one of our migrations will be to start using test certs that are coming out of uh, our certificate provider. And we're expecting certified devices very early in Q2. Um, and my job's on the line for this one, so. Okay. I mentioned briefly, and I know I'm running out of time, we, we're not stopping here. Then the uh, Field Area Network 2.x uh, marketing requirements, they've completely ballot now. So this is what do we do next? And how do we do this in a way that doesn't strand what we've already done? How do we migrate? How do we evolve? So we've been looking at distribution automation use cases, higher data rate buys, how we do peer-to-peer -peer comms, ultra-low power operation. So it's possible currently to connect battery-operated devices as meet nodes onto the mesh, but it's not defined in a consistent way. So that's part of what we're doing here. So deep sleepers for water and gas metering. And then looking at the additional regional support. So we go to totally global, and then the integration of uh, wise sun electricity, which is power line. <coughs> so very briefly, electricity was uh, the IEEE published 1901.2 uh, and 2A in 2015, and that's available from IEEE. Uh, there was a successful electricity buy in 2014, and that was done by Home Club Forum. Home Club, we've been working with Home Club for a long time, and have a liaison agreement as to how we can have a um, consistent layer three and layer four. Uh, so mesh routing, um, the, the, the base, the, basically wave device discovery works on heterogeneous networks, so a mix of wireless and power line carrier. Hopefully, uh, folded, what, a year ago, and Wysan became the custodian 
of the home flight activity. So we have a working group going on that's looking at how we integrate this. Um, and so the electricity GPS, which is the trademark for the layer two and four over this uh, stuff, was approved in 2017, and we're about to start doing uh, testing events on this. So that's what the protocol stack looks like with the wireless on this side, 1901 on this side. Then there is a uh, basically a, a, a layer here, an adaption layer that lets you talk consistently about that. Okay. Interest, sorry, uh, it's, on the, it's on the net, you can get it later. Industry collaboration. We collaborate with other organizations. We have liaison agreements with OpenAVR, um, all of these other guys. The most recent one was DLMS User Association. So DLMS is a very popular metering application layer, um, particularly in Europe and Asia. India has adopted this. Uh, there is now a joint working group that's looking at how you do service discovery and commissioning, etc. DLMS provides hooks um, for the application to then uh, inquire about the radio devices, so we're uh, deriving a consistency there. Uh, Econet Consortium of the people in Japan have been providing the uh, application layer for home energy management. That's it. So, membership is open to everyone. We look forward to um, having you as members. Any quick questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>